So by way of introduction, my name's, uh, my name's Brady Weirich, and um, it's kind of funny how this all went down last night. Uh, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about this particular conference, I, I actually volunteered to speak. I told Kelly that I'd be happy to, to do something for you. And then um, she got back to me and says, actually, there's no time because Dr. Kevin Connors was going to be here. And trust me, you wanted to hear from, De from Kevin Connors, not me. But last night, the call, text, whatever came in, and we're at dinner. And this is literally like 7.30 last night. Kelly looks at me and goes, hey, Kevin's sick. Can you speak tomorrow? OK. <laughs> so as much as I'd like to, to, to be like my friend, uh, Dr. Eric Balkavich, and say, here's the, here's the principle, and here's the study that backs it up, I just did not have time to go through and back up everything I said with the, the appropriate studies. So I'm going to allude to studies. I don't have the direct links to them in this, but they are there. Everything I say today is backed up by, uh, by papers, by studies, et cetera. So just keep that in mind. Uh, my background is in chiropractic. I, did, I went to Texas Chiropractic College. I graduated 16 years ago. I don't know how the time's gone by that fast. Um, I am Carrick trained. I was a diplomat in, fun in uh, functional and chiropractic neurology. For political, reason, political and financial reasons, that diplomat status has actually been retired, uh, but the, the education component of it has certainly continued, and I still practice that today. Um, Intermountain Center for Wellbeing is our clinic. We are located in Idaho Falls, Idaho, where my wife Kim and I run this business. We, do, we have a weight loss program. And the reason why we call it a weight loss program is because in Idaho, we're about 15 years behind national trends in just about everything, including functional medicine. So from a business aspect, if I were to advertise that we have a functional medicine program or an autoimmune protocol or whatever you want to call it other than a weight loss program, the phone's not going to ring. So we call it a weight loss program, and when people come in and consult with us, we'll sit down with them, tell them why their gut's a mess, tell them why we're going to clean their gut up and help everything work better for them, and the side effect of that is losing weight. So when you see our information out there, we do talk a lot about weight loss, but the reality is it's a functional medicine program because this stuff works, right? So whenever I go to a seminar or a conference like this, I try to take um, at least one or two little clinical tidbits away from that particular seminar, and I've certainly gotten that from, from this particular seminar. Uh, Eric and Kelly have been absolutely brilliant, and it's been, it's been enjoyable for us. So um, Kim and I do have a, <clears throat> a, a small podcast. Uh, I looked at it last night, and our last episode was up to a whopping five downloads, which means that not even my mother is listening. Uh, but we do sit down, and if you want to really hear the story about why we do what we do, I'm not going to take that time today. We actually did that in our last podcast. So if you want to hear Kim's story about lupus and how she manages her lupus without using medications at all, the story's on there. If you want to hear the full story about why I'm standing here, why I do what I do, it's in that last podcast. So I'd love it if you guys could bump it up to at least 10 downloads. So uh, we try to have guests on there. Uh, we do plan on recording something with Kelly later, and um, I'm hoping Eric will join us at some point. So uh, we just that's something we do for fun, and we have a good time. So this is our family. Uh, I'll save you the math. There's eight of them. Uh, this is the other reason why we do what we do is because we have an obligation, as we all do, to teach these this next generation how to take care of themselves. We're at a crux right now in healthcare, quote unquote healthcare. It's getting worse and worse. And as I'm sitting there talk, listening to Eric talk about lab testing yesterday, I should probably say Dr. Balkavich, sorry. As I'm sitting there talking to, or listening to, to Dr. Eric and, and Kelly yesterday, and I'm thinking to myself, the sad thing is, the more and more that this is coming to light, the more information and studies that are coming out about how to make someone truly well, we still have the medical community that, have, that are held up on this pedestal that's like unto deity, and they're still dead wrong. So we have an obligation 
to teach the next generation how to take care of themselves. Because if we don't, there is no hope. So, um, here's why I live in Idaho. <laughs> there are certainly other areas that we could live that have higher population densities that are more up-to-date with current protocols, etc. But there's not many areas where you can take your daughter and her dog for a trip down the river. <laughs> So that's why we're in Idaho. So what I want to do today is by the time this next half hour or so is up, I'm going to convince you that zombies are actually real in the spirit of Halloween. Not in the sense of there is a brain-eating amoeba out there that's causing us all to turn against each other and eat each other, but there are environmental toxins and environmental factors that are disrupting brain chemistry and if you want to prove me right, I challenge you to go to, Mo or to go to Walmart today and watch people. Watch how they mindlessly walk around in poor posture, poor health, making bad decisions that are making themselves worse. These are the zombies that I'm referring to. Hey, what are the causes of these? Eric made mention of this thing called Frankenfoods yesterday. Very interesting study about violent criminals and the omega-3 to omega-6 ratios. A optimal ratios for omega-6 to omega-3 is 3 to 1, meaning we have to have omega-6 fatty acids. We have to have some stress in our lives or we cannot survive. But to offset that, we have to have at least one omega-3 fatty acid for every 3 omega-6. A standard American diet... Taco Bell, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A. A standard American diet is 10 to 1. So there was a study where they took blood work from violent criminals. Anybody want to make a guess as to what the ratio was in these violent criminals? 30 to 1. So don't tell me that dietary factors are, are not playing a role in our current situation that we are in. A dietary factors are disrupting brain chemistry and creating, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Abnormal thought processes. A electrosmog. Does anybody else feel gypped by this whole 5G thing that's been shoved on us? It's supposed to be faster. It's supposed to be better. Does anyone, has anyone noticed that it didn't do a dang thing? Yet it's emitting so much electro smog that they've had to shut 5G down around airports because of how it's messing with airplanes' instruments? What is that doing to us? We've never had this in our... <laughs> we've never faced something like this in our health. How is it affecting us? Hey, there's a great book that's by Dr. Mercola. I know the, the media is trying to, trying to make this guy go away, but he won't, which is awesome. But he wrote a book called EMF. I highly suggest that you read it. All I will say is that electrosmog, all these devices, Bluetooth, 5G, all of this stuff may be non-radiating ionization, but it is affecting us. Hey. Last thing is this screenagers. I got this yesterday. I love that screen. I think it was you or Kelly that said it. Hey, we're going to talk about what this is physiologically, what, how this is actually affecting the brain. And it's not just from a social standpoint. It's not just from comparing ourselves to the Kardashians. There is actual physiologic things that happen when we glue ourselves to our phones that we will discuss. So, sarcastically, Yes, zombies are real, but I'm going to explain to you why. All right, so here we go. Neuro First thing we've got to understand is this, t this thing called neuroplasticity. I am in big, big trouble for putting this picture in there. Hey, I can already see Kim's eyes rolling and her head shaking. But this, this, this principle of neuroplasticity, the easiest way to explain it is this. Your nerves are just like muscles. If you exercise them and give them fuel, what are they going to do? They're going to grow and get stronger. If you don't exercise them and give them bad fuel, what are they going to do? 
they're going to die. Plain and simple. Okay. So if we explain it like this, Mary Lou, would you please take Jeff's hand? Hey, Jeff, will you take Roland's hand? And I would, ma'am, I would include you. I don't know your name yet. I'm sorry. Catherine. Catherine, thank you. Now, Mary Lou, what I want you to do is I want you to squeeze Jeff's hand. Okay, now Jeff, squeeze Roland's hand. And Roland, squeeze Catherine's hand. So if I have a, ner a, a system in our nervous system where Mary Lou is the end organ, and I have her send a signal through that chain, Neuroplasticity says that that's, the more we fire that chain, the stronger the signal is going to get. So if we want to make Catherine stronger, we have Mary Lou start the signal and we repeat that process over and over. And it's, okay, stop. <laughs> hey, that in a nutshell is neuroplasticity. Now this can work as an advantage or it can be a disadvantage depending on what the signal is. So if the signal is a stress response and we repeat that stress response, what happens? It gets stronger and stronger. If it's not a stress response and it's more of a rest response, what happens? The signal gets stronger and stronger. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's put this into terms. Oh wait, I did throw one study in here because it was up on my tabs. I had studies in my tabs, Eric, are you proud of me? Look at this. Associated, so this is uh, the, journal of uh, the JAMA Journal of Neurology, Association of Daily Step Count and Intensity with Incident Dementia in 78,000 Adults in the UK. Okay. Our findings suggest that approximately 9,800 steps per day may be optimal to lower the risk of dementia. Now, I'm going to throw in here that I, think this, I, I used to think that the step count thing on these fitness apps was kind of silly, but that's just my personal thing until I saw this. We estimated the minimum dose at approximately 3,800 steps per day, which was associated with 25% lower incident of dementia. Other studies have found 4,400 steps to be associated with, with mortality outcomes. What does this have to do with neuroplasticity? Everything. Hey, our brain thrives on our outside sensory input. But guess what also has a huge input into our nervous system? Hey, muscle spindles, ever heard of them? Golgi tendon organs? The receptors inside of our muscles that tell our brain how long, how strong those muscles are? What about joint mechanoreceptors? Those receptors inside of our joints that tell our brain where our joints are in space. So basically, to me, what the study is saying is the more you fire all of those systems, the stronger the brain's going to be. And oh, by the way, we can reduce our incident of dementia by 25%. And what happens to that incident of dementia when we add on top of that proper fuel sources? Healthy fats, low sugar. It's not part of the study, but I'd be willing to, or I'd be willing to bet that you could make that number even higher. All right, so you cannot have a talk about neurophysiology and stress without having talking about the gut-brain connection. They, one of the studies that I wish I had time to find was the head injury in mice study, where they actually took mice, whacked them in the head. Whose job was that? <laughs> they whacked these mice in the head, and guess what they found? They found occludin and zonulin antibodies when they just whacked them in the head. What does that mean? Where's occludin and zonulin found? It's in the tight junctions of your gut. So they whack the, head, the, the mice in the heads, and what do their guts do? Their guts fall apart. Can't tell me there's not a direct, a direct connection between the gut and the brain, because there is. Also, the, the blood-brain barrier is histologically a lot like the gut-brain barrier, or the gut-blood barrier, excuse me, so when you disrupt the gut, what are you disrupting? The brain. Hey, ser where is most of our serotonin produced? It's in the gut. Now, I know there's been recent studies that have kind of debunked the whole depression serotonin paradigm and that has said that most depression is actually an inflammatory condition, not a serotonin condition. But where is that inflammation starting? You don't have to have head injury to have depression, so where is it starting? Inflammation from the gut, which links back to what? 
the standard American diet. Okay. Gluten sensitivities. This one, I could rage on and on about this one. Okay. Most gluten sensitivity symptoms are neurologic and have nothing to do with the gut. Let me give you two examples. Both of these come from our neighborhood. <laughs> we have people in our neighborhood that will show up on our doorstep asking us questions. It's kind of funny. One example was a young lady had a lot of depression, anxiety, and some dizziness issues, went to the doctor, had an MRI. Hey, doc, what did the doctor say? Everything's normal. I looked at the MRI, what did I see? White plaques in the frontal lobe. What causes white plaquing in the frontal lobe in a 23-year-old girl? Gluten sensitivity. What did mom and dad say, ha have to say about that? Well, when you take someone who's sensitive to gluten, you get a dopamine response, and when you get a dopamine response, what do you have? A crackhead. <laughs> so, not, not literally a crackhead, but you have someone who's addicted to gluten, which includes mom and dad, and so when I start talking about diet changes and eliminating gluten and eating more like we do, what do they do? Oh, that's not the problem. Couldn't be the problem. The other example, individual has a rare, what he calls a rare neurological disorder. Counts him out from a lot of activities things, and, and other things that he wants to get into. But I see him pulling up to the fast food restaurant that I know has zero gluten sensitivity options. What does he keep doing? There are people that will literally have brain surgery rather than eliminating gluten from their diet when that could be the main source of their problem. They would rather have that badge of honor of saying, I went to the University of Utah, had brain surgery, I have a brain, you know, now I have this cool scar, but I could have avoided all that. You see this in your practice, don't you? It happens all the time. Hey, we could even venture off and talk about type 3 diabetes. What is type 3 diabetes? Alzheimer's. It's blood sugar dysregulation that starts in the brain. Well, now, thanks to Dr. Eric, now we think of everything as a stress response, an adaptive stress response, a multi-system failure. Why is the brain not, not um, metabolizing sugar correctly? That's an individual question. And now, as practitioners, we need to be asking the question, why? What is, what is driving that response? Hey, from a neurophysiology standpoint, you've got to know a little anatomy. The way I explain this to patients is think of about a stalk of broccoli. Last night we had broccoli as a side order. I laughed when it came out as that gigantic. They literally just like roasted the stalk of broccoli. They didn't bother cutting it up at all. It was awesome. Hey, but when you talk about a stalk of broccoli, you have the stem and then you have the flower, correct? So, same thing with the brain. You have a brain stem and you have the flower, which makes up your, cort your, um, your cortex. The brain stem itself is the home of our autonomic nervous system, the things that happen in us automatically that we don't have to think about. After today, I want you to divide the brain stem into two parts. You have a sympathetic part and you have a parasympathetic part. The sympathetic part is the midbrain or mesencephalon. The parasympathetic part is the pons and the medulla. Okay, so we are going to look at a cross section of the actual midbrain, which is home to the on off switch to your sympathetic fight or flight nervous system. So when you're being chased by the proverbial tiger in Eric's words, what part of your brain is active? The sympathetic nervous system, which is home, which where is its home? The midbrain. Does this make sense to everyone? So let's take a cross section of the midbrain. We're going to cut that sucker just like this, okay, and we're going to look at it. How do I work the laser here? Okay, this is the front, this is the back. Okay, this cerebral aqueduct here is, is full of, uh, of cerebral spinal fluid that goes down into the spinal cord, just so we have anatomy worked out. Hey, so we want to talk about this red nucleus. These two, whoever drew this was nice enough to give us red coloring here for the red nucleus. That particular nucleus is 
the on switch to your sympathetic nervous system. So when you are under a stress response, that red nucleus is overfiring. And when you get nerves that fire and fire and fire, what do they do adaptively? They get stronger. Okay, so think about this. We have this thing called the reticular activating system, which when it gets activated, it changes your respiration rate. So when you're being chased by the, ti the proverbial tiger, what's your respiration? Shallow and fast. Okay? When we see these people that are chronically sick, how do they breathe? Shallow and fast. Okay? What is this going to do to digestion? Shut it down. What is it going to do to our sex drive? Shut it down. What is it going to do to our sleep? Non-existent. All of what you said yesterday, Eric, arises in the brain from those red nuclei. What else does that do? Let's talk about this blue light wind-up thing. The optic nerve has branches that terminate directly into the red nucleus. So when we pull out our phones and it's, tw and it's 11.30 at night and we're looking at this ultraviolet light on our phone, what part of our brain is that activating? That red nucleus, which drives us into what state? A sympathetic state. Okay. We have this thing coming from that red nucleus called the rubrospinal tract. The rubrospinal tract controls anterior muscle, the tone of anterior muscles above T6 and posterior muscles below T6. So you think about brain function, as brain function decreases, what happens to posture? The anterior head carriage. You get muscle to overfiring of, of your anterior muscles in your arms. So you start to get this posture. What do these screenagers look like when they're on these phones? You combine this with the blue light hitting that, that same spinal or that same nucleus. What are they doing to their sympathetic nervous system in this state? So what am I trying to put, what am I trying to say here? Take it back to the zombie thing. Go to, go to Walmart today and go look at how people are, are walking. And think about this rubrospinal tract because that is nothing more than adaptive stress responses. What are they trying to protect? Okay. Your, this red nucleus also drives cortisol. Hey, what happens to your adrenal glands when you're under stress? They dump cortisol into the system. What does cortisol do? Makes you more perceptive to pain, increases your respiration rate, decreases digestion, dumps blood sugar into the system, on and on and on. Hey, can you see how this particular area of your brain plays a vital role in this entire response that we've been talking about all weekend long. Hey, theta waves. Your brain works on about five main frequencies of electricity. They're called your, your waves, your brain waves. Hey, when they're all working in concert together, it's like, a, it's like a symphony, right? You have a guy or a gal Guy leading this symphony and you make this beautiful music, right? When you're making that beautiful music, you have positive thoughts, you're sleeping well, you're digesting well, everything just seems to be in synchrony. Well, all of a sudden you get under this stress response and these theta waves get overactive. And these theta waves are suddenly drowning out what the conductor's trying to portray. And when that happens, you go from a beautiful symphony, symphony to an eighth grade band. You no longer have beautiful mu music. What you have is a cacophony. A, all of these theta waves are coming from overfiring of this particular area. And a key part of this is getting this under control. So how do you do that? Why is this happening? A, the first step is figure out how to get the gut back into a normal rhythm. Now, there are beautiful products like L-theanine that are available to us that can help get this back, the, the, at least the, the brainwave part of this back under control. They can help regulate that stress response. 
But again, as practitioners, we need to be asking the question, why is this happening? If we want to separate ourselves from the medical community, we've got to ask more, better questions. If we don't keep digging, we aren't going to be any better than the guy or gal down the street that's just telling people, there's something wrong with you, it's in your head, there's nothing that we can do, when in reality, there's everything we can do. So I appreciate you guys giving me this time. Thank you, and uh, look forward to the rest of the weekend.